Good morning. Lunch is at one. What time? Twelve fifty. What time's lunch? Lunch is at one o'clock. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do this a little different because I'm gonna try to tell you why we're going where we're going, and then I'm gonna end up telling you what it is that I want to do as far as how we want to get rid of TDM in our our networks. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Um, when you think about our networks, in order for us to be in order for us to meet the next evolution of where DISA needs to be in order to providing service to the warfighter, we're going to have to relook at how we make our networks survivable, more resilient, and more secure. Thinking about that, several years ago, the director decided to reorganize DISA, and we have a kind of a build function where we are building out capabilities like mobility, uh, video services, and other types of services that prepare us for the next future. We even stood up a cyber directory purely focused on the delivery of cyber capabilities and cyber services so that we can actually posture our organization for the next evolution of for security. Um, how are we going to do assured identity? How are we going to deal with inside of threats, both, and then how are we going to deal with our external threats? So all of those things are built into those. We also have an innovation group inside of our, what we call our build function, so that we can actually innovate or try to innovate with the help of industry on where we need to go. Part of that evolution is what I'm going to talk about is with is TDM. No matter, about, no matter what we do or what we build, we're going to have to be able to operate that. And where I reside, as part of the DISN and what we support, the DISN today provides all the terrestrial support, it provides all the SATCOM capability, all the connectivity that brings the Department of Defense uh, communications capabilities together. Um, and also in support senior leadership communications, coalition services, and um, when we talk about senior leadership communications, we're talking about everybody from the President of the United States to folks in the Pentagon, other embassies and other folks that we support. So there's a lot of stuff in this portfolio, and all of those folks want the latest capabilities. Um, the department has always typically evolved around what a customer requirements were. Customer wants a certain capability today, we build that capability, and then we wait for the next requirement to occur. What we're trying to do with the organization now is build out the capability that the customer is going to need and posture for the future. For example, when I try to give my, uh, I have a young son who's going off to college, and um, he plays soccer. Now, I'm from Albany, Louisiana. Nobody in Albany ever played soccer, right? So we don't, I don't in fact, he thought it was a basketball when we took it out with my little cousins. Uh, but he went off to college to play soccer, and we were trying to buy him the latest computing platforms for him to use. I actually bought him this whiz-bang laptop, and he's like, what am I going to do with that? I don't, I don't need a laptop. All I need is a, my tablet and my phone, right? And he does everything on that tablet and that phone. And when I look at some of the folks that we have in the Department of Defense, it's the same way. The young folks that are coming into the department, the young people that we are providing services to, the people that are much younger than myself, they don't operate this way at home, and then when they come into the government, they have to operate differently, right? So I say all of this to lead you into why we want to do this TDM elimination, why we need to change the way we deliver services and capability. The organization is now structured the right way, where we can build, we can operate, and then we can secure our capabilities to achieve a desired effect for the department. Now we got to begin to make sure we posture our networks to do those kind of things as well. Under the enterprise infrastructure, and this is only the enterprise infrastructure services, there are also other capabilities and services that we have at DISA. This does not address any of those other capabilities. It's only the stuff that provides the network fabric by which we use to deliver those services. So if you were thinking about it in an OSI type model, it would be layers one through four. is the primary capabilities they have there. There's some five and six. And then... The, uh, voice services at, at presentation level to level seven, but we typically operate the layers one through four. The foundational pieces that make the network fabric work. So if I was equating it to something that you might recognize, if I was building a home, this would be the foundation, this would be the driveways, this would be the walls inside of the facility, this would be the electrical outlets, this would be the plumbing. All those things that make a home special is the undefined fabric of this infrastructure. The things that people see, like the really cool pictures on the wall, right, the, the nice couches and stuff, that's the presentation layer. I don't do the presentation layer. We do the infrastructure fabric as it, uh, that you would have like you would have it on the home. 
All of these are the things that fall up under that portfolio. It's a global service with global connectivity that reaches every corner of the globe. So Afghanistan, Iraq, Southwest Asia, the Pacific, doesn't matter what region of the world, we actually support all of those, those uh, capabilities. We also have the boundary protection capabilities that's built into that infrastructure and how we'd be able to respond to those, the, the internet access points and those type of capabilities as well. So that's who we are. Now I'm going to tell you what it is that I really need your help in doing as we begin to move out towards this, what, what I'm calling TDM elimination. And I'm, with a primary focus on prominent channel banks and other legacy type of technologies that we want to take out of the network in 2018. Okay, I'll say it again. In 2018. Because most people are not going to believe it. So we're talking about taking it out of the fabric in 2018. I'm not implying that all the customers will be done in 2018. But the part that we own, this infrastructure piece, I want to be done with all of that in 2018. So as you think about where we want to evolve, there are, there are four different areas where I'm trying to evolve the network. There's the core evolution, meaning the underlying Disney information systems network, the backbone pieces of what make the network fabric there. We call it the, the Doden or the Disney core. Those are the things that we call core. Up there, we're deploying 100 gig uh, optical transport. We're building in survivable transport into those areas. We're increasing the size and the demand for the bandwidth um, in those areas. And part of doing that means we have to eliminate the legacy technology and underlying legacy technologies that support that in order for us to create a ubiquitous network that's survivable, right? Today in the government, we typically talk about five nines reliability. Well, when you talk to other companies like the Googles of the world and other companies, they're talking 11 nines, nine nines. They don't allow their network to go down, now, at least from a customer perspective, right? So we, how do we make that customer fabric survivable? How do we give the same level of service to our warfighters and the other leaders in the department that you get if you actually go to your Google Mail? We should be able to do that. Now, is that cheap? Obviously not. Is there a cost to doing that? Yes, but it's the right thing to do. So evolving the Disney core is a critical piece of how we get there. But as we evolve that core, the next thing we have to do is make sure that the access evolves as well. So the customer access, how they connect to our network. What are the pieces that bring them into the networks so that they can take part in the services that we provide? So if we're not going to have any legacy capabilities in the network, we got to have some way of allowing that customer to connect to us, uh, transition to us while they evolve. Because they're going to evolve over a different kind of time span. So at we call the edge, or what we call the access points, we're going to need the ability to support mobile services, fixed services, satellite services, whatever capability that that customer at the edge is looking for, how do we provide them access to our Dizen core so that all those services are available to them anytime they want them, anywhere they want them, and in any fabric. So that includes being access from um, like the dirty internet. If someone's in a hotel, how they get access to, to our network? What, what capabilities and fabric? How do we bring them back into our fabric securely so that they can operate within that network? That's a huge challenge because it's something that we haven't done a lot with. We have niche capabilities, but it should be a common capability that we have. You probably heard the um, Lieutenant General Lynn talk about something called the gray core. So how do we make the network so it, it can handle any types of capability, any types of classifications that the customer might, might want? That would include how do we virtualize stuff both in the Disney core and at the edge? And is, is, are those capabilities today available and reliable? And can we actually afford you? Right, that's kind of an important piece. One of the things, um, like as we transition to Ethernet, one of the things we're discovering is the Ethernet services will cost more than the traditional services that we have today. So although we have these great capabilities that industry is offering, but those services are more expensive. That's a non-starter. We are the Department of Defense. We don't have an endless amount of money. So if we're going to evolve to new technologies, those of you that provide those kind of services, you also need to provide us a cost point that makes that more 
advantageous for us to move to the new technology, right? So if I was going to go out and buy a new mobile device, they typically will give me a price point that makes it advantageous for me to move from my old device to my new device. So if we're going to move the DOD forward, we're going to make, you got to make sure that you give us price points that are advantageous for us to move forward with the new capability. Obviously, you got to make a profit. That's why you're there. Because if you don't make money, you ain't going to be around anyway. And that's no good for us anyway, right? So you got to make the money. We're good with that. But also make sure that the department can afford the capabilities that you actually are providing. Um, and then we got to provide gateway services. The way we look at gateway services, and the way I look at gateway services, I should say, is that we have a variety of types of customers. We have coalition partners. We have people that we call frenemies, at least I call them frenemies. Today, they, one day they are a friend, the next day they are an enemy. An enemy sometimes becomes a friend. In some places where we're, we thought we would never support some folks, we're now supporting those, those countries and providing services and capabilities with those countries. How do we do that? How do we bring them into our network core? How do we provide them access to support the capabilities that we, we have? What, what are the next evolution of coalition services that we can plug into our networks to allow those partners to ubiquitously use the services that we already can provide? And how can we do that securely? How do we do customer separation? How do we do classification separation? There's a lot of things that we don't know the answers to that we need energy to help us do that that actually leads us down this path to what we're calling TDM elimination. Um, critical infrastructure enhancements. <coughs> you heard me talk a little bit about the fact that there are many commercial companies whose networks are much more survivable than us, and they, they're not, people's lives are not depending on the service that they provide. How do we make our networks survivable? If, if Amazon or Google or those folks can do 11 nines, why can't, I, why can't we do it? And then what cost can we do that? And then what would that look like? Is it just wires and cables connected together? Or is it just that and satellite connected together? Are there services or capabilities that we can just buy from you? Can we buy a, a network capability for a region from a commercial company that already has that capability versus us putting in a circuit from point A to point B? Are there other ways that we can deliver this, those services? And I'm telling you, we are open to all of that. We're open to looking at these things different. We're open to looking at us providing service. We're also open to you providing us, us services as well in order to move the department forward. But the key thing is how do we make the network survivable from a customer perspective, okay? In operations, we got to make sure that whatever we put out has the resiliency built into the network that our operators can depend on that service being available so they can support the mission and capabilities and functions that they, that they need. The various combatant commanders need service and capability. They don't care how we deliver it as long as it works, and it needs to work well, and it needs to work well all the time. So how do we make that more resilient? Obviously, one of those steps is to eliminate the legacy technologies that are currently in our network. Another thing I call operational support. When we look at how we provide operational support, we have these connectivities between our computing and our um, wide area networks, and then we also have our coalition networks, and then, then we also have the SATCOM capabilities and networks as well. How do we build that in such a way that we can operationalize all of that to give a common operation picture to those, those operators that need that information and can use that information in support of their day-to-day -day missions? Now, it can't be some static display. Obviously, you can work with you and you can put in feeds and you can pull information from sensors and you can throw it up on a screen, but Say that there's something that comes up on the screen that a, a, a data center or a computing center is out. Can I hit that button that tells me what capabilities and services are going to be lost or what capabilities and services are going to be transferred to another computing facility? How do we make that common operating computer something that's more usable to a, uh, an operator so that they can do something with the information and not just look at the information and write it down on a piece of paper? All right. What... Make it usable for them to be able to do something with the information so they can deliver those services and capabilities. Um, then improving security. We think everything just needs to be in some, some level of encryption, whether that's commercial encryption, whether that's NSA type encryption, but we need to be just encrypt all of it, right? There are lots of different methods to do that. There's lots of ways that you offer those capabilities. We're looking for 
various types of answers so that we can actually decide what's the right approach to do for that. And we're going to be looking at transmission security for the continent of the United States and other places as we move forward. This is kind of a, a look of, of where we are with the different dimension. See, you see a lot of different kinds of connectivity. We have wireless capability connected into our network. We have coalition mission partners that's connected into our networks. We have core data centers, or we, or we call various types of data centers connected work. We have the tactical users at the tactical edge, all connected into our networks. Uh, then we have our base camp posts and stations, all using our service delivery nodes to provide connectivity into the network. So we have all of these folks across the globe trying to get access to the services and capabilities that we have in the network. It's, it's a complex environment. But it needs to be reliable, and it needs to support a variety of types of capabilities and customers. You see GRSS is part of that uh, defense between base camp posts and stations. So we're adding GRSS to our, our stack. We already have the internet access points where we have the outside boundaries for ingress and egress when we look at security. But we need it all to work seamlessly across a common infrastructure, and we believe to do that, legacy technologies have to come out of the network so that the network becomes more resilient, more reliable, and it can actually support the capability the customer need. Think about it like a wall outlet at your house, right? You never question whether it's going to work or not. You plug it in, and you hit a switch, and things happen. We want the network to be that way. We don't want you to have to put in a requirement to ask us to do something for you to get a service. You should just be able to access our networks, get whatever service or capability on whatever type of device or mechanism you want to use, whether you're in a coalition environment, whether you're in a tactical environment, whether you're in the continent of the United States, how do we make that network just like that electrical outlet is just there? So that's the intent behind where we're trying to go when we talk about TDM elimination. Okay? Now I'm going to get into the specifics of what I want to do with TDM elimination in itself. I could talk all day about all the things we're going to do and the projects we're going to do with evolving the networks, but the focus of this discussion is how do we eliminate TDM in our networks, and I'm going to give you the very specific things that we want to eliminate. In 2018, and you're going to keep hearing me say that, in 2018, how do we eliminate TDM in the core backbone of that Disney infrastructure? All of it. And then how we provide the access points for the customers to then access our networks, even though they will not have evolved as quickly or rapidly as we have, we're going to work with a lot of folks across the department to help them evolve by 2020. Right? So they have to have time to palm for it. They have to have time to transition. They have to have time to, to buy capabilities. And we think you, that a lot of you probably have solutions at the edge that customers can acquire. We want to make sure that we present those to customers so they have options and capabilities that they can use that are readily available that we know will work in this kind of environment. For those that are ready to transfer and those that can't transfer for whatever reason immediately, how do we still provide them support, even though none of that legacy capability will still be in the Disney core? Right. So, as I look at the Disney, we talked a little bit about this earlier, that there's multiple layers in support and then all of the various domains that we actually provide support for. Right. Our, the main goal that we have is to satisfy the department's requirements, not our requirement. And the department has evolved to going from traditional circuit-based, computing-based uses to an IP transport. How do we provide this, all of this capability in an IP environment? So in an IP environment, it's not as resilient. I know you don't believe this, but it's not as resilient as the old legacy stuff was. But we can make it that way, and we've done it in a lot of areas. So if you look at some areas, it's absolutely resilient. It absolutely works great. But I will submit to you that nobody will, that anybody that has a mobile phone will not accept that same kind of service in their office. If they have an office phone, they would not accept that, you know, they just lost a signal. <laughs> or if you're on a VTC section and it just goes down, you will not accept the fact that it just goes down. You'll accept it on your mobile device because that's what you would come to. But how do we make that mobile capability just as resilient as the capability that you have today on your traditional landlines? Uh, I think it can be done. I think we just got to look at how we, how we do that then we're going to have to harden everything. You've seen some of the cyber attacks that we've had. You've seen the ones that are in the news. There are lots of things that we can talk about as far as 
inside a threat, both and also external customer of, uh, coming into our networks, just trying, adversaries trying to get in our network to do bad things. It happens every day. And I will tell you, our operators are probably successful 99% of the time, but you hear about the 1% of the one that got in, but they do a tremendous job of protecting our networks. But we got to make that easier for them to do, and we got to eliminate other uh, attack vectors so that we can make that simpler for them to do by hardening the network. And then we got to reduce the network complexity. We have something different for every type of box, every type of capability a customer has, but we, it should be about what the service is that the customer needs. What are the things they're asking us to deliver? What are the services they're asking us to provide? Then how do we deliver those services? That's part of my reason for we have to eliminate the TDM uh, legacy capabilities in our network. And then we got to improve the agility. You shouldn't have to come in, put in a request, wait 30 days to get a service. You should be able to come in, get a service either immediately or get a service over you know, days, not weeks. So how do we create a network where you can actually get service when you need it, not when we can deliver it? So we want to build the network out just like other customers do where you can get provide immediate service. We are not there today, but that's where we need to be. And if you listen to the stuff that Lieutenant General Lynn talked about, in order to do those things, the network has to change. And we have to change it now in order for us to get there. And we're all bought into the vision. We're all bought into the strategy. So we go, but we need industry's help to get there. We can do so much, but we need your help in helping us get there. We talked about this where we, where we are today, where we have these dedicated services. We want to get away from this look, you know, the, the TDM across all the infrastructure. We have duplicate layers. How do we do reduce the complexity of that network? How do we reduce, eliminate those TDM type of capabilities? Now, we talk about voice of IP is one of the base services available and adoption is increasing. Voice of IP has been around since 1999, right? It, it ain't like it's, it's novel. It just seemed to be novel to us, right? <laughs> so, how do we make those things that are routine as, as commercial services become available, whether we provide them or whether you provide them, how can we make those common services that customers can equate to? Just like on your mobile devices, if you need something new, you just download the app, you hit a button and it's available to you. We need to make sure our Disney Core can actually become resilient and actually be able to provide you the ability to support various types of applications and, and capabilities. And cloud services is a key component to how we're gonna do that. We are, we are committed to the cloud and providing connectivity to those clouds, both commercial clouds, and if there's, in some cases, the DOD cloud services. So I want to eliminate that. I want it to go. Low speed TDM should be a thing of the past. It should be something we talk about like we, we talk about buggy whips, right? Ain't nothing wrong with buggy whips. They work very well, right? But nobody drives a buggy. They all drive cars, right? So it's a utility that just, just has passed this time. The, cap the legacy capability we have, we just need to, to eliminate it because I'm not going to go back to riding horses. That's just not going to happen. I actually like my car. So I don't think anybody going to be buying any buggy whips anytime soon. Right? If you are, please raise your hand because I... All right. All right. So we're going to be adopting MPLS. We need to adopt it. We have MPLS in the network. We, we haven't got it out fast enough. So I am pressuring my team to get it all done as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I probably won't tell you the date because if I tell you the date, my, my team will they'll pass out. So, but then a great adoption of other types of services. But I'll tell them in private so they can pass out without everybody seeing. So TDM elimination, which is why my main main reason why I wanted to, to talk to to you today. I want to take the network from where it is today to where it needs to be in 2020. That includes the elimination of the legacy capabilities and the low-speed TDM capabilities by 2018. Now, we talked about datums elimination, prominent elimination, channel banks. Those are all type legacy services that we need to do. But let me ask you that, especially though those in the industry, is, do you think that's a reasonable objective to eliminate in 2018? Those that think it's reasonable, you can come see me. Those that don't, don't bother. <laughs> We're doing it in 2018, so those that can will be on the team. Those that can't, well, good luck. All right? Um, 
the technical outreach. There's another piece of this that we we have about 4.5 million users in the Department of Defense. Of those users, we got to figure out how to transition their capabilities and services that support, and not all of them support uh, old TDM type capability, but how do we create an outreach program that helps them help themselves, right? So DISA will do what DISA does in order to move us forward. We will do that. But how do we get you to help us to help them, our customers, move from where they are to where they need to be given their particular conditions? So some of the things we've been thinking about is, you know, we're establishing um, a part of the outreach program is an approved product list of vendors that have capabilities that, are, that can transition between TDM and IP. Uh, uh, capabilities that are already ready for those customers that are ready to transition that they can go out and acquire from, from you so that we can put those in, into the network so that they can uh, do the things that they, they need to do. Um, helping customers see the value in things like MPLS or, or what's after MPLS. Um, so we can't reach all of those people. We need your help in reaching those people and we need folks on our team like you to help us reach out to them so that they can figure out how where they need to be and how they're going to get where they should be um, as we go forward. Then we, we have things we call commercial Ethernet gateways. We, we have some ideas about how we think that should work, um, but we're open to new ideas. As long as they help us do it in 2018, we're open to, to new ideas because we're going to have to have some, how do they acquire commercial services, come into our network, we call that uh, commercial gateway, Ethernet gateways, how do we do that? And then how do I convince you to drive the Ethernet cost down? <laughs> because right now it's too high and it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for customers to transition. I don't, I don't know anybody in the department that will transition from something that costs $500 to something that costs $3,000. That, that, that just, the math won't work and it's just going to be hard to get there, right? So we have to wait till the price points uh, come down. But I think the, 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 the volume of customers we have should make it more palatable to somebody or to some vendors that, that will actually consider providing those type of services. Um, and we want to leverage a lot of the commercial capabilities that you already have. So we provide MPLS, but in some cases it's better for them to leverage your commercial MPLS offering or other commercial services, your voice services or your video service or your collaboration services, whatever that might be, it may be in better in some instances for them to leverage your capability come through one of our gateways so that they can then acquire other Department of Defense capabilities that they might need or they might want, want to use. Um, we're going to complete the MPLS footprint in, in the DISN core in FY18. Obviously, there are circuit transitions that will actually happen after that that will continue probably into 19 and on because we're talking a lot of circuits, thousands and thousands and thousands of circuits. And then it's also how they use them. It's also building the, uh, the various VRFs and the communities of interest and how do we build all of those in. And that's going to be a customer by customer on how we reach out to them and how we help them move forward. We're going, we can't do that all. We're going to need other folks on the team to take on those kind of capabilities with the Air Force or with the Army or with the Navy and, and other folks as they begin to transition to this new core that will be available for them to access as services. Um, somebody, oh, it's over there. Somebody has a question? No, okay. All right. And then we want to we want to coordinate on how rapidly we can transition those customers. Now, I talked about, you know, the customer transition, but you working with them also means you got to work with us. And this is a very complex, a lot of moving parts, a lot of folks, and it's customer by customer, region by region, combatant command by combatant command. It's going to be a lot of work, which means we need a lot of help in, or, in order to do that. So that's going to be the hard. We'll be able to do the, the Dizzin part, but the customer piece, we need to help them do that, and we need you to help us so we can help them. And they're going to need staff support. They're going to need uh, project management support. They're going to need folks to help them do their internal base camp posts and stations on how they begin to evolve those types of capabilities. Um, but the, the outreach is going to be the key. And the SUNS architecture we talked about there, that's us adding 
um, IP into our SATCOM platforms. Today, there, there's a lot of TDM that's done in the SATCOM platforms, but as we eliminate TDM, we're going to eliminate it in, the, in, the, in our SATCOM um, uh, downlinks and uplinks. We're going to eliminate it there as well. We're beginning that project this year, um, and my team doesn't know, but they got to be finished by 2018 as well. But, but So both the SATCOM and the threshold piece, the SATCOM guys really didn't know they would have to be done by 2018. So I think they probably know now. Uh, so all of that part has to be done. So we, we want to bring the SATCOM as well as the terrestrial pieces together as far as eliminating of the legacy uh, technologies and the ca legacy capabilities. So what's the benefit? Um, I, I know what the benefit is in the department. I know the long-term reason why we do that. Obviously, security, resiliency, the ability to provide more capability, the ability to provide more services, make it more redundant. But somebody's going to say, well, how does it save me money, right? That's one of the things we always do. I think it will. It may not initially, but I think it will save folks money if we, if we do it the right way. Um, so we got, to, we got to go on this educational campaign. We're going to have to teach people why it matters to them because that's what really counts is customers are not going to do things for the benefit of this. They're going to do it for the benefit of themselves. And then we got to help them understand why it matters to them. And we got to make it valuable to them as they begin to transition to this new architecture or this new capability. Um, virtual technology scare folks. And I, I've, I've been to a lot of booths in here today, and you have a lot of stuff that's being virtualized. And I think it's fantastic. I think you've got to figure out a way to communicate that to folks that don't typically work in the IT environment to why that virtualization is, one, it's good for them, but how, how is it safe? Because people know how to hug a box, right? They know that that box ain't going to go nowhere, but this kind of thing that's virtualized and it's not real, they can't touch it. It's very hard for folks to understand how is that secure and how could somebody just, why wouldn't it just disappear or you get vaporized quite easily? You need to help them understand that in your messaging as well, is why it should matter to them to go virtual and why that, what's the benefit. And more important, how do you secure it? I know you do, because I can see it in all the booths. You, you, got some great, you got some really great stuff, and you're doing some really great things out there. But help customers understand how they can leverage that. Virtual firewalls is, is just a hard thing for a customer to grasp. It's going to block something, and I can't see it, but it's going, to do, it's going to do this thing in the sky, and things are going to just stop, right? So if, I would say if you're going to talk to a customer about virtualization, talk to them as if you were talking to your spouse or your significant other or somebody that didn't work in this field, and then explain it to them, and if they say, oh, yeah, I got it, then it's something good, right? IT folks, we all get it, but I'm telling you, the customers, they, they just do not, they, they don't get it. And it's the way of the future. It's a great way to go, but we need your help in the to communicate that message, right? Um, and we want to do virtualization in the backbone as well. So we want to do some virtualization in our core backbone as well. We want to build some um, cross-functional teams. We want to build teams that has industry involved in it, our we have a bunch of field office. We want them, those folks to be involved with the, at those touch points. We need other folks at, at this and across the department to be involved in that. So we want to start these kind of a customer engagement forms so we can begin to have these conversations. So I'm going to ask my team, and we're going to build out to have industry come in periodically and meet with us and meet with the customers so that you can tell them all the great things you're doing, and then they can decide how they can leverage their capability, and then we can decide how we can implement those capabilities. So we want to bring the people that are providing the capabilities and service together with the people that need the services and capability. Um, so it's not just a bunch of engineers and program managers in the room, but people that actually need to acquire the service. So we're going to do that. We're going to have these technical interchange meetings. We do it today with customers, but I want to bring in industry to be part of that conversation. And then we're also going to do some one-on-ones, or well, my team's going to do some one-on-ones. They don't know that yet, but I just told them. Um, with, with industry as well. So that, because you know, you don't talk in a room with full of, when you're all in the room, you don't talk at all. You don't really ask questions. So we're going to do one on one so you can actually be honest, so you can actually open up and, and help us help a customer. So if you have a capability, we want to put that, we want to put that date together, just like speed dating. So we're going to blind date you. We're going to put you together so that you can deliver some capability to help a customer get where they need to be and to help us get where we need to be as a department. Um, yeah. 
other thing is, when we look at how we fulfill requests, today, that's a very manual process. You fill out a form, and that form gets filled out, and it gets sent to somebody, and then somebody else fills out the form, and then somebody else checks it, and it goes to somebody else. And about 30 days later, it ends up with a person that's going to provide the service. What I want to do, and we're going to do, is we're going to automate the service from the customer making a request. So if it's, if it's capability that we already have in the network where you want to go from point A to point B, and now you want to go to point C, if that's already built into the network, you make the request, put in your credit card or, or your check, pay for it, and then it automatically routes it there. Today, we, we actually do paperwork to deliver that, even though the network may be resilient enough. We want to use software-defined networking. We want to use other types of capabilities in order to build a network out so that customers can make requests and get and acquire services that we already have. We're doing that with our Tier 2 and Tier 3 VPNs using SDN. Um, we started that journey. We'll finish that journey, I'm, I'm assuming, in the next six months. At least that's what I was told. Um, and then we'll start on the next group of capabilities, like how do we do automatic failover when you read a certain bandwidth level? How do you deal with a certain situation where you have a, a common outage that occurs and then it just automatically reroutes that traffic somewhere else? Uh, how do we leverage technology to do a lot of things that today we ask people to do? You know, at our internet access points, if one's saturated, how do we automatically route that traffic to another internet access point that doesn't have as much traffic? And the same thing applies to some of our security devices. How do we do that using technology, not people? So if you come in at us with, like, you need 20 more people or 30 more people, that's the wrong answer. We want to know how you can help us use technology, whatever that technology, in our computing centers and in our wide area networks. How do we use technology to solve some of those things that actually occur fairly routinely in our networks? You know, uh, we have a circuit out as probably once, twice a week, at least, sometimes more often than that. But if we have that out, is we actually, the team does a great job out the traffic. Why can't that be automatic? Why can't, if that, they detect the cable cut that's not there, why is that traffic just not automatically out routed? And then we just go and fix it at, at later on. Why do we have to have authorized service outages in order to fix something on the network? Why can't we just automatically route the traffic? And so that we never, from a customer perspective, experience something as an automatic service interruption. Have to do it, but why can't we build the network in a way that allows that such that re resiliency? If we look at the cyber aspect of it, if we have something in the network where someone attacks the network and they get in, why can't we isolate them and then route around them and then let the, the, the smart people go in and, and do what they do, the forensics on that particular piece, but why do we have to, like, have hundreds of people getting into the network trying to fix something when we can just have the network isolate that particular situation based on certain conditions that are, are programmed in. So we need your help in helping us automate it. Request fulfillment is one of the first places you want to do it. There's other places in the network that we need to do it. I think we believe SDN is one of the answers. Uh, if there are other answers that can actually help us do that, we're asking you to tell us what those are, what it is that you're leveraging to do those, those kinds of things and uh, we, would, we, we would actually look forward to uh, adopting those. One of the things I did not put on this slide that's, that's extremely important to, to me is Gray Core. We call Gray Core, as we need to build that out. So if, someone, if any of you have answers to that, uh, I'm, I welcome that. I've seen a lot of different kinds of solutions, but I'm not sure they all scale, but we, we have what we call an unclassified network, NipperNet, we have a classified network, secret, we have a TS network, and then we have other networks for other types of things. And all of those are separate. We have coalition networks. How do I make that all gray? So that I just have a network where you access it. That's what we call the gray core. How you access it to provide a variety of types of services. We have mobility gateways. We have travel kit gateways. We have gateways for organizational messages. Why can't I just have a gateway? What? How do I do that? How do we do that in an, in, in, in an infrastructure? How do we revise that infrastructure so they can support all those kind of things? So we need you. We need your help in, in helping us get where we need to be and help where, where we need to take the department. Um, TDM is going to be one step. We can, now, we can chew gum and walk. So we're talking about TDM elimination. I talked about some other things. We can do all those things as well. So TDM is a priority for me because it's a priority for my boss. <laughs> Therefore, it's going to get done. But we also have other priorities that we want to work on, and I'm happy to entertain those as well. 
again, we can do multiple things at the same time. It's a, it's, a, it's a big network. We have a lot of things we need to do, and we need your help to get there. So with that, I will open it up and see if there are uh, any questions that you might have of uh, anybody in the audience. Is that yes, no? I, I've actually got a question. Oh, yeah, question. Okay. Yes. So um, look at this. With MPLS, we're actually going to have a lot more information that can be shared with uh, C&D groups. Have you all already engaged them to see what their requirements might be for any sort of data that they might want from this? We, we have not engaged them, but that's actually a very good point. We... Uh, We've, we've engaged a lot of the nutritional uh, service providers, but the C&D groups, that's, that's actually a good point. So uh, Darren Freeze is actually going to do that. He doesn't know that, but he's going to do that. He's going to engage the C&D group because he's handling MPLS, mm -hmm. and then we're going we're gonna to work on that. Okay. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll do that. Are there any other questions for me or anybody on my, on my team? Okay. Thank you very much.